you have a good time. No adults, you can't go back there. I know you want to. You're really going to want to when you see the next curriculum. I'll tell you what, it's pretty cool. How sweet, how sweet the presence of the Lord is. and What a good worship set for what we're going to be talking to you about today. But before we get into the word, we're going to um, lift up uh, um, Carolyn in prayer. Uh, Tina was talking to her and the doctor has told her that she's no longer allowed to drive her car. And, uh, you know, and when that happens to a senior saint, um, it's devastating when they don't have family around because, you know, uh, the vehicle means freedom. Remember when you turn 16 and it's like freedom, you know. Uh, well, and later in life when the keys get taken away, it's, it's difficult. And so she's discouraged and it's come against her. So we want to pray for her this morning for God to encourage her. Um, and to uh, give her direction and her daughter direction. I've, I've, I've been praying that she would decide to go and be with her daughter, you know, and family, and I think it would help, but she's still pretty set on staying here. She just, you know, feels like, I'm just ready to move to heaven instead of move to here, you know. What's, what's the point if I can't drive and can't do that sort of thing? That's, that's what that discouragement will do to you. And so um, we want to just pray for the joy of the Lord to, uh, to fill her. The Holy Spirit, who is our lead and guide in our life, um, will speak to her what God's best is. And that's true for all of us, not just for our sister. All of us need to do what God says to do rather than what we want to do and what we choose to do. Uh, some things in life are a challenge. You know, I'm getting ready to start the major part of my training tomorrow, and and uh, I think everybody pretty much knows they've expanded it. Instead of ending the 31st of July, it's going to go all the way through October 11th. And, and all of us that hired in are, you know, are like, man, there is so much more than what we thought <laughs> this was going to be. And uh, and so um, we were doing some pre-training this previous week, and it's like, oh, wow. I'm going to be 60 years old this week. And it's like, what am I doing? Why would I be doing um, just under a year's worth of training <laughs> for a job that then it takes another year or so to start to really do it, you know, um, and they said, you never perfect it, and it's like, man, this is serious stuff, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me ability, I'm believing God to help me, and um, to accomplish that, um, as Lisa said, the storms that we just sang, sometimes we can speak to the storm, and the storm goes away, there's other times Jesus talked about the storm coming for the person who builds their house on sand and who build their house on the rock. And when Jesus said that, he said the storm came to both. So the house on the sand is the unbeliever that's not built on faith in Jesus Christ. The, the house built on the rock is the believer who's built on Jesus, the cornerstone, the foundation stone Petra of our lives and he said in both instances the storm came the winds beat ve vehemently the King James says vehemently what a word that's a good word against the house and so the winds blew the rains came and the gales were going and the house built on sand fell and great was its fall but the house built on the rock stood and you could say withstood the storm he will be with you he will get you through anything and everything he's faithful 
And so with that in mind, let's pray. This feels like a storm for her. I can't imagine. I've never been to that place in my life. I can only, I, I say imagine how hard that must feel. But I can't truly understand it. None of us can unless we've went through that. But we can obviously empathize. 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 I think that's us working. <laughs> As vehemently and, and emphasize. Pam gave me liquor before service. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm light it came in my mouth. And uh, it's all numb. Um, but we can, we can feel the, the, the pain and take some of that. So let's do that. Um, and while we're doing it, you know, because Carolyn's one of our senior saints who's not been able to get here, you know, um, uh, let's pray for Maybelle too, you know, for God to just be with her today. I know she's watching. Um, she's faithful to watch the streams and and uh, and stays connected. So she's with us every Sunday in our services that we stream. And um, and so even though we don't see her physically here, she's connected. And and uh, and so let's just lift her up in prayer as well this morning. Let's thank God for what He's doing in Lisa's body and. Uh, and if you would, um, believe God for me to have some relief with a, 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 what seems to be a pretty uh, serious tooth infection. <laughs> and so I um, need that to, to be healed so that I can go into this training tomorrow and not have the um, discomfort and distractedness of, of what that does. So, um, so. Let's, let's just believe God. And if you have anything in your body, receive that right now. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son. In the name of the one who, who, who made the way. He is the way maker. He is the promise keeper. And, and in the word, there are these exceeding and precious promises regarding healing and, and provision and and peace and joy and and comfort from the Holy Spirit and we thank you for these things manifesting in our sister Carolyn's life right now. Lord, let your Holy Spirit just move into her home, into her temple of her body, fill her with your spirit afresh and anew. Let her just have that that experience of being filled Lord in a in a wonderful way that just sweeps away the discouragement and depression that's trying to set in the hopelessness and even despair that would that the devil would want her to get into and move that away as peace as comfort as joy as boldness as just uh, your presence moves through her let her just feel it in the depths of her soul and may her spirit be rejuvenated right now we pray. Oh, let your abundant life manifest itself in a mighty way for her right now. That even as we pray this prayer, she experiences a personal revival. Encourage her, we pray. Build her up. Use us to be an encouragement in the natural as well. And we pray, Father, for you to give her wisdom and her daughter wisdom uh, in, in making decisions regarding her future, her days ahead with a, with a new kind of limitation on her. And, uh, and just show her the way, Lord, and, and have, have your way in her life. We know your desire is for her to have life in abundance to the full until it overflows. Even now, in her twilight years. And we thank you for that. Oh, we thank you for that. Open the way before her. Shine the light on the path and let her follow. And Father, we lift up our sister Maybelle, 
who hangs on to her joy, who keeps her faith, who trusts in you, who shares updates and reports every month with us to just know that she's connected and, 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 and the prayer that we can give to her uh, for her regarding pain and limitations in her own physical body. We pray, Lord, that you will touch your child right now. Heal her, Lord. Strengthen her. Fill her as well with your Holy Spirit. Bless her, we pray, Lord, and, and we just thank you for our connection to her. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you that you remain Lord. When we first accept Jesus, you remain Lord until the day we enter into eternity. And that you have a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And I just thank you for using her to be an encouragement um, to her family, to share her faith, and to continue to reach her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, um, impacting them by her own personal testimony, even as she has been doing. And we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for being God. Thank you for doing that in Janie's life and giving her the vim and the vigor to even be away and join family right now, Lord, and to, to let the light of Jesus shine with her, her family. And we give you praise for these things. Lord, we pray that you continue to let your anointing work in Lisa's body in a mighty way, bringing about the full uh, manifestation. We know that what you have begun, you will complete. You are faithful, and we just thank you for the good report of the progress. But Lord, we just thank you that, that, um, that it, will, it will be completely gone and that she can just live in the freedom and energy and clearness of thought um, to do the things that you've called her to do and to anoint her father in her ministry, we pray. And we thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, personally for my brothers and sisters who are joining together with me to be able to do well um, in the things that I have set before me that I will be able to um, achieve the goals, uh, make the markers, keep up, understand. And thank you, Father, for your personal healing power at work within my body. And we just give you the praise and the glory for these things. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of provision in our lives, and we worship you with our tithes and our offerings. We truly worship you because you are our provider. And we thank you as we present our tithes and we give our offerings this morning that you are and making your promises regarding our provision uh, manifest in our lives and that the blessings of heaven, uh, of the windows of heaven being open um, are pour and pouring out blessings from your resources of heaven are manifesting themselves in the natural in all of our lives and that we will have abundance and the security that you desire for your children. And we thank you for the word as we get ready to get into it and pray for anointing to be upon me to share the message that you want to communicate, that it'll be your words and not mine, that we will have the help of the Holy Spirit to gain insight and understanding, revelation, um, and as a result of the word, we will leave here better than we came in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I still sense the presence of the Lord up here, so it's just sweet. Um, am I lisping at all? I'm, I don't think I am, am I? Hopefully not. Pam told me I'm going to have slobber coming out and be lisping, and so it's like, is that going to happen? And I'm going to be uh, seen by billions of people all over the world on the internet, um, you know, because you know the whole globe's watching. Um, you know, they've turned off every other stream, and they're watching the journey stream right now. <laughs> What was that? A piece of microphone stand fell? That's weird. All right. Well, we have been doing what I have called the David series. And we started with a first message um, that we titled A Giant Story. And if you recall, last week we did our second message in the series 
is a king story, the story of David the king. We, of course, started with David as the giant slayer. And today, we're going to be talking to you about David the priest. He was a priest and a prophet in the Old Testament. And, um, and it, it, I think it's going to communicate and it's going to relate. I have a lot of scripture for you. But let me give you kind of a historical foundation because we talked about how David came to be the king, that Saul had been chosen to be appointed king. God did not choose Saul. And he chose David, and we talked about that. Um, we gave you uh, a scripture um, where uh, that happened. Um, I didn't put that in, but... Um, Oh, no, no, it's going to be a little bit further down. I stuck it in in a different spot. But I want to give you a little context and why God didn't want Saul and what God did in choosing David that you may not fully um, understand, but maybe it'll give you a, a, a fuller picture of it. See, First Samuel opens up with um, the priesthood of Eli. And it talks about um, this priest Eli who sits on the throne and as we said the nation of Israel said we want a king we want a king you know I always do my funny thing we want a king and um, and how they got Saul but but God had been using um, religious leaders because God was the leader of Israel and so they had judges and priests that and prophets that really had the the leadership and the influence in Israel because it was a theocracy. It was, uh, God was the king. He was the one who they were to be trusting in. And so he had his servants to do that. And we, you know, if you're doing a Bible reading plan, you've read through all of that already in the first part of the year where the Levitical priesthood was initiated and all of that. And you had the priesthood of Aaron as well. But the Levitical priesthood, the Levites, were given the care of the temple and the sacrificial system and the high priests, you know, and all um, Aaron and, uh, and his kids went through that. But Eli is the, is the, um, the high priest. And, um, and in a sense, he sat on the throne. He had the, the leadership. But he had two sons and they were corrupt. And we meet um, in, you know, and see the story in the book of Judges of Hophni and Phinehas and, and the things that they did. But we know that what they did, because Eli didn't lead his children well, didn't discipline them, didn't deal with them, even though he was aware of some of the things they were doing, like embezzling stealing offerings from people, demanding more, taking the money. They were having sex with the women who came to the temple. And so they were profaning the holy place. And they burned strange fire in that place. And, and God judged, um, obviously, them for their sin, but Eli for his sin of not being responsible in dealing with that and keeping that place holy. He didn't lead them. See, God calls for priests to honor Him and for them to lead others into His presence, to worship Him and to serve Him through worship and facilitating and helping others to be able to do that. And Eli and his sons especially were doing the opposite of that. And so, by defiling the priesthood, God kind of pulls back and is canceling that leadership in the Levitical priesthood because because they're not doing what He's called them to do. And so... Then you have, um, with all the turmoil and this all going on, then you have 
the cry for a king, you know, with the the um, the Philistines and other surrounding nations that we showed you, the Moabites and Edomites and Mosquito Bites, all the other nations, um, you know, bringing problems. So they wanted a king. And God's like, you really don't want that. You need to get, you know, leave it, have a judge. But humanity with a sinful nature comes short. And, uh, and so you really need God to be sovereign. And so what you want is to have the right judge, the right priests, the right leadership. Not looking to natural solutions for spiritual problems that manifest themselves in the natural. Well, they get Saul and Saul sins and we haven't been able to talk about Saul because he's not the topic and get into it, but he really, really sins and, and is everything that God warned them about. And then we know that... Um, uh, he has a different plan. And I'm going to read the passage to let you kind of see where he turns from this priesthood and says, I, I've got a better way. I'm going to do something. They, they wanted to go to a natural solution, but, but I think you'll find this interesting. First Samuel chapter 27, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 27. And we're going to read verses 27 through 35 and see this judgment and God's re response to Hophni and Phinehas and to, to Eli. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him? He's talking about Levi. Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod? I want you to pay attention to that to wear an ephod before me. That was the priestly garment. And did I not give the, uh, to the house of your father all of the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? They had a portion of the offerings that came in. And again, if you've done a, a, a Bible reading plan, you read through all of that and how there's a certain portion of the different offerings that God provide, provided for the Levitical priesthood. They didn't need to get more. They had plenty. Why did you kick at my sacrifice and my offering which I've commanded in my dwelling place and honor your sons more than me? See, that was Eli's sin. To make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. And you notice he says, honor your sons more than me. To make yourselves, not to make them fat, but yourselves. He was, they were kind of given him from some of that. So he had corrupted him as well. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now, the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, so that there will not be an old man in your house. And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place despite all of the good which God does for Israel. And there shall not be an old man in your house forever. He's canceling that Levitical priesthood that should have went on, but they didn't do their part. But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Now this shall be a sign to you that will come upon your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Then I will raise up, now listen to this prophecy, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. That's what a priest is to do. To follow the leading of God and help others to do that. 
I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. Now, I want you to look at this verse 35, and you'll see, um, of course, the, the word I is always capitalized. You know, you know, pronouns are. But look at myself, my heart, my mind, my anointed. What do you notice about those M's? They're capitalized. But I will raise up myself a faithful priest who will do according to my heart and mine. I will build him. What is, what is that priest and what is that H? And what is the he? What is the H? Capital or lowercase? So God has this plan. They want to call for something different. See, God was looking and planning for David before they even called out for a king. And David could have been a priest and prophet and done what Levi's uh, house didn't do. Eli and his sons and, and the others were corrupting that. And so God's like, okay, I'm going to make a new source and establish a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom through this leadership. But we want a king. And he said that, that people will come into the holy place and, and corrupt that and that happens and the Ark of the Covenant's taken away into the land of the Philistines and all this stuff's going on. And then they, they choose, they want a king instead of just trusting God who says, I've got a plan. I'm going to raise up a person and a throne and establish his house. And it'll be a sure house. I will build this. But they choose Saul instead of, of that. And God let them do that. And we saw that it was consequence. And then... Because when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Then David comes along. And, and so God's announcing that he's going to have um, his own faithful priest from a household that can be counted on. And we see that, and that was the verse that we shared last week for David as king. But uh, now as I elaborate, I wanted you to have your eyes open and your revelation expanded more that David was not only the greatest king of Israel, but he was also when he was anointed. And let's go to 1 Samuel 16, 13. And you remember the horn of oil that Samuel poured on David and anointed him to be king when he was still a child and he went back to the... He was anointed from that day forward, but it wasn't just as king. He was being anointed as a priest, as a prophet called by God. And so let me just remind you of that scripture from verse 13 in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Remember all the brothers went and, and, um, and Samuel is now uh, the spiritual leader. Eli's gone. And uh, Samuel comes and says, oh, look at this fine, strapping young man, the oldest of Jesse's sons. And it's like, the Lord says, no, it's not him. And then the next one's like, oh, well, then surely it's this one. And goes through them all and it's like, is there another in the house? Yeah, the youngest who's out tending the sheep. Bring him before me. And the Lord says, that's the one. That goes all the way back to what he was saying when he brought this judgment to Eli. This is who I have chosen. This is the one who I will have a name. He will have a throne. And I will establish that and make it a sure throne. And so David is anointed. Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward so Samuel, Samuel arose and went to Ramah. And so you see that with that anointing, 
Yes, as a leader, there's anointing, but that spiritual anointing was more than just his kingly anointing. It had the spiritual anointing of priest and prophet that came upon him. So he's already having God's movement of the Spirit, and that is what enabled him, as we shared last week, to be able to then move forward and develop. God's training him, and he's practicing the presence of God. He's worshiping the Lord, even as he tends the sheep. He's being faithful in few things, what he's been given to do, and letting God take care of timing and planning. He knows what he's been anointed to be, but he's just going to let God be God, and God will take care of all that. See the difference between how um, people try to do it in the natural and what David his approach from the get-go was. Now, as we showed you, David, you know, cast his eyes on a woman who was taking the bath. That's why her name's Bathsheba. You know, that means one who takes a bath in, in the presence of the kings. No, I'm just kidding. It's easy to remember who David sinned with because she was bathing <laughs> in his eyesight. And her name's Bathsheba. But... um. But he sinned with her, and it and it and it it was bad. And um, he also um, had to do a lot of war and battle. Okay, and, and I, I want to set the stage that God can do these things, and He can use us. And that was the big thing last week. We're imperfect. We fail. We miss it. We have flaws. But God can use us if we keep a humble heart, repent. And, and continue to do the best that we can to seek God, to worship Him, and, and have Him help us in our weakness. See, His strength will be made perfect in our weakness because His grace is sufficient for us. So when David became king, David um, did something. He, he decided to move the kingdom... And, you know, we talked about this. This is over years and things that are going on. We decided to move the headship, the headquarters, the capital of the kingdom to Jerusalem. And, uh, um, and that just happens to be the place where Melchizedek was king of Salem. So he's moving it to this place, this holy place where a holy priest and king was represented. Because Melchizedek was a priest king. Like David was anointed to be a priest king. And David is a type of the priest king, Jesus, who is Melchizedek of old who had no beginning of days. Anybody know of anybody who never was born? Who was eternal? I mean, Jesus eventually came. That was a theophany. Jesus eventually came to be um, born as a baby when he moved into a physical body, but Jesus predated that and never had a beginning because he's God. And Melchizedek had no beginning of days and he's eternal, and that's Jesus. And uh, so Jesus fulfills that, and you see that in the book of Hebrews and everything. And, and so, um, so we see this plan, and that God is going to have this priest king, David, who is going to be a, a, a foretype of Jesus. And that's what I want to try to share with you. So I have scriptures, that just, and we're just going to read through some passages and get there um, because I want us to see what God did and what God wants to do now through us and what he will do through Jesus in the future. So David wants to move the capital and the, the throne to Jerusalem and he decides to do that and, and he, is gonna, he secures the Ark of the Covenant through battle and captures it, recovers it. And he's going to bring it to Jerusalem. So we're going to pick it up there. Second Samuel chapter 6, verse 
12 is where we're going to start. And, um, and if you're hesitating, saying, well, I don't know if that's really talking about David. That's probably just talking about Jesus. Secondarily, it is, but did you, do you notice the capital letters? It's kind of a help in when you're reading it, you know, in these uh, translations that are recognizing this isn't God he's talking about. It's David. Now it was told David to King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom. And, um, and I should just say, because I don't have time to go through all of these scriptures, that you probably remember the story that David is bringing the ark and he's doing it the wrong way. He puts it on an ox cart. And they're taking it in there, in, you know, leading it to Jerusalem. But that's not how God set it up. Again, if you've done a Bible reading plan, you read that. Why did the Ark of the Covenant have the rings and the and the and the rods that were, um, lay, you know, overlaid in gold, and the rods went through that? It was for the priests to carry the Ark on their shoulders. So never touch the Ark. You put the rods through there. And you lifted it by those rods, not lifting the ark itself. But they put it on a cart and they're just driving it in there. And this is important. You say, well, well, why, why did Uzzah get burned up? Why did that all happen? Why didn't the Philistines get burned up and stuff? Because they weren't, they weren't saved. They weren't. You know, they, how, how did the Philistines come in? How did they move into the temple? How could they do something like that? Because th- they, didn't, they weren't surrendered to God. God has a, a way for us as His children, as His called out ones, to live and present ourselves and how we approach Him and how we live our lives and approach others. We are going to see that we're called. I'm going to give you the end from the beginning. We're called to be kings and priests. And so Uzzah has the fire come down. David gets all burned up and angry with God. And, and he just they're right there by the, the threshing floor of Obed-Edom. And, uh, and he says, just, just put the ark in, in his barn, in his threshing floor. And this is where it's picking up. Because Obed-Edom all of a sudden started having great prosperity, favor, and blessing. And it was so significant, it was noticed, and David was told about it. And when David says, look at how God's presence, represented by the ark in the Old Covenant, how God's presence is bringing Material provision and favor and blessing. He's like, I guess I'm not so upset about this after all. I'd like to see that for the kingdom. I'd like to see that in Israel, in Jerusalem. So he goes back to get it. So that's kind of the set the stage. So David um, was told by um, the uh, people who've seen this that the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark or the presence of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with gladness. See, it's already being called this. It's already getting recognized because God's establishing His throne even as He said it. It's the city of David. Yerushalayim. God's city, but God's doing this through people because God set up this natural world and He uses people to have His will done. doesn't make Him not God. It makes Him God, but this is how He created it. And so we function and operate within what He created. And there's a proper way. They didn't do it, but now He goes to bring it the rest of the way And he brings it with gladness. He's excited about it. 
But listen to this. Verse 13, so it was when they, when those bearing the ark of the Lord had gone six paces. This time, they're bearing the ark. They're not riding it on an ox cart. You know. And Uzzah meant well. It hit a rock or something or went into a rut and it started shaking. Uzzah reached out and it says literally he took hold of the ark. He touched and you touch the holiness of God. The anointing. I, I'm going to tell you, we can't pollute God. He can't let sin be in His presence. That's, that's why we need Jesus and His blood and everything. I can't get into it all, but we can't. He's holy. And so that sinfulness comes in contact with the anointing. And, and it consumed Him. Not God being mean, just the purity, the holy fire of God just consumed him because that corruption couldn't touch it. Think of it like an armor all or a, you know, a protective thing. It just has that effect. But now they're bearing that. And they go six paces and then he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Who was called? Who did the sacrificial the sacrifices? The priests. But David is doing that. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a... Remember what I told you remember? A linen ephod. He was wearing the priestly garment because he was not only king and had been anointed king, but he was anointed priest. And he's doing the sacrifices every six steps all the way to Jerusalem. Now he's operating the way God wants it to be. This is what we see about David. Lisa mentioned when he was discouraged. And yet he would, be, he would remind himself that the Lord is still in control. When David would blow it, David had a soft heart that would repent and he would correct, which repentance means to turn 180 degrees and go the other direction. David was teachable. He would learn and he would repent and get with God's plan. That's what made him a man after God's own heart. Not being perfect, goody two-shoes, holier than everybody else in, in, in everything. We see his flaws. God saw fit to let us see his flaws to see his mistakes. We talked about Bathsheba in his kingly role, and now we're seeing how he blew it, and I didn't have time to go through the whole Uzzah. I know you remember it, because I'm wanting to talk about this priesthood, um, but he didn't start out doing that just right. But he learned, and now he's doing it right. And he's wearing the linen ephod, and he's priest, and he's king. Now, the clergy and the politicians are dignified offices in this world, are they not? And we're supposed to be dignified. It's not okay to be uncouth. Do we have a lot of people in our country that are all upset? That's not, that's not presidential. That's not, you know, senatorial. That's not how the way a judge should talk, act, or behave. Do we not get a lot of that? It's supposed to do that. But let me tell you, what is appropriate, because David's doing it right, and I'm going to show you that he's doing it right, because God's going to approve of it, and we're going to show it to you from the Scripture. But what David was doing as he worshipped the Lord, when it says he danced before the Lord, it means, it's the literal meaning of the word rejoice. Has, how many of you like to rejoice in the Lord? Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, Rejoice. What does the word rejoice mean in the Hebrew? To leap up and whirl about. Rejoice in the Lord and in the power of His might. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. That is the literal mean, meaning of rejoice. Not hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I rejoice. I'm going to do what Pastor said last week. I'll rejoice. You know. You know, I'm not feeling the beat. I'll just follow pastor's lead. I didn't listen if anybody was doing it. Where did I set my bed? And so, 
David is doing that and then sacrificing every six steps. We rejoice in Your presence, but in Your presence we know we have a sinful nature and so we sacrifice. Help us in our sinfulness. So the priest, in his priestly garment, in his kingly position, is doing what I just did. Now, how many of you are comfortable rejoicing in the Lord? In the sanctuary, let alone, have you ever had the Lord move on you and rejoice in the Lord in your driveway? Or the Spirit of the Lord moves on you and you got to pull the car over? I've had to do that before. And get out. Oh, glory to you, God! Glory to you, God! Had to do it. I was out, I haven't mentioned this in a long time, but one time I was out and I was barbecuing and I, we had this big ditch. I have a big, we've always lived on dead ends. It's like God puts us on dead ends. There's a lot of life on dead ends. You know, you get away from the natural and you just have the presence of God. So dead ends are great. We've lived on five dead ends. The, the, the vast majority of 40 years of marriage, 40, over 40 years of marriage, has been on dead ends. <laughs> and just like our dead end now, now our house was right at the dead end, there was just, but there was the drainage ditch, just like I have one where I live. It's just a little further because there's a couple lots that are unfinished. But there's this drainage ditch and there's trees and then there was Milton Road. And I'm in my driveway of a split foyer down there. Not really ever thinking anybody's paying attention looking through the trees over at me, but the Spirit of the Lord come on me. I was worshiping the Lord as I was grilling some meat. And I just like, oh, praise you, Lord! Praise you, Lord! Hallelujah! And I was praising Him and speaking in tongues and singing in the Spirit. And then I get to work the next week and somebody's like, I saw you out there acting all crazy. What was you so happy about out in your driveway? Are we comfortable to rejoice in the Lord? Or, oh no, wait a minute, I'm not in the church. i got to be dignified. I'm a member of the clergy. I need to wear a clerical collar. I need to, I'm, I'm, a, a, I'm a leader of a business in town. I need to be presentable and join the Chamber of Commerce and act in a certain dignified way. It's not appropriate. This was appropriate, and we're going to read and see that this is the proper way. To practice the presence of God. And exercise priestly duties. Are you with me? So he's dancing before the Lord. Verse 15, And David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Amen. I'm trying to get some amens out of you. It's okay to... Glory to God! Hallelujah! The, you're worshiping the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord. You take off running. Brenda's like, I want to see that. Did anybody run? I said, I ran last week. Actually, I was just at, I, I was showing you how somebody that had the Spirit hit him <laughs> run. But I ran a couple times around this sanctuary. But when the Spirit of God, it's okay. That's what David did. And there's joy in the presence of the Lord. And they shouted. It was loud. Church doesn't have to be quiet. It's always supposed to be solemn. I grew up in a sitting on your hands religion. And, it, and, and, and I'm all for reverence. And there's a time for the holy awe and the reverence of the Lord and silence. I've been in a service where the silence hit. We were having Holy Ghost meetings and they were loud and there was manifestations like crazy and we had television cameras in there um, 
uh, str- you know, uh, not streaming, <laughs> uh, but airing it live on the Christian channel. And, um, and so the camera operator's in there. Of course, as I mentioned last week, I was the, over all the ushers and security and everything for meetings, so I have this, and I'm, I'm over, and I hear <laughs> the people in the camera truck speaking on the radio to the camera operator. We've lost sound. What's going on in there? We've lost the, the audio feed. And he's like, it's, he, you know, you could tell he wasn't even moving. He didn't dare move his mouth. He's like, it's holy silence. <laughs> and I don't know what's going on. A holy awe hit us, and it just went on and on and on. There was no coughing. There's no, <clears throat> there's no nothing. No, can't you believe what's going on? Nothing. It was silent because of the, presence of the Lord that can happen but I'm going to tell you in the presence of the Lord there's fullness of joy and it is common and frequent to have it very outwardly loud <laughs> so when you're singing it's okay oh hallelujah I know I may, I know I can be heard but that's all right So David danced, uh, uh, David, they, the sound in the trumpet, verse 16. Now as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, or Michal, uh, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and whirling before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. See, she was the daughter of Saul, and, and he was, remember, whoever kills Goliath will get the daughter of Saul. That was Michael. And and she's thinking, she's a naturally oriented person. She's a king's daughter. She's a princess. Now she's a queen. She's married to the king. So she sees King David, who is King David there, but, but won't acknowledge priest David. Dancing before the Lord. So David and all the house of Israel, oh, I'm sorry, uh, she sees him. Where am I at? My, my, my thing moved. So, then they brought the ark of the Lord and they set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it because he had a desire to have a, a tabernacle. He had a desire for a temple. I don't think we're going to get there. Then David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. Who, who, who was called to offer burnt offerings and peace offerings? Who was called to wear linen ephod? Who was called... Who, who, in the Bible that did these things had to be anointed in order to do that. The priests. Is David a priest? Absolutely. Without question. My screen's not locked. That's why I keep smoothing. And when David finished offering, burnt offerings, peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. That's what a priest will do. And he distributed among all the people, among the whole multitude of Israel, both men and w- women and men, to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his own house. God's blessing, his, uh, his presence is there. And, and David, by faith, is already manifesting, giving because of the prosperity that is going to be manifesting itself within Israel and Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So he he gives because we do that. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David. She didn't even wait for him to get in there. He goes in order to bless them and have God bless his household. And so he's going in there to do that. And she comes out there with an attitude. And she said, how glorious was the king of Israel today. Uncovering himself in the eyes of the maids of his servants as one of the base fellows shamelessly shamelessly uncovers himself. 
you're not wearing your royal robe and your crown. You just got that linen on and you're dancing and making a fool of yourself before the lowly people. Like somebody that just gets in their underwear and dances around like a crazy person. So David said to Michael, and that's not Michael like male. And I know in today maybe we need to qualify that. For those listening, you know, and hearing audio and not saying, that's this was her name, Mikhail or Michael. I don't know how you pronounce it, but uh, we have a daughter named Michelle, and that's the feminine version of it. So you could say she was a Michelle, <laughs> but that was the way they said it. It was, David said to her, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father and all his house to appoint me ruler of, over the people of the Lord over Israel. Therefore, I will play music before the Lord. That's who God was speaking of. That's the heart God was speaking of. The man after God's own heart. That is who he wanted to be the king because of that heart that attitude and that's why God had that plan and so when Saul's removed it wasn't the descendant any of the sons and, and all of that of Saul to take over even as God said I will give it to another person and establish his family his throne and make it sure and I will play I will not only be king before the Lord. I've replaced your father as king because God chose me instead of him. But I will dance. I will worship as priest and lead as priest before the Lord as well. I will be king before him and I will be priest before him. It wasn't for the, the people and anything else. I'm leading them by me practicing the presence of God me putting God first in there. I'm setting the example and leading them into the presence of the Lord. And I will be even more undignified than this and will be humble in my own sight. But as for the maidservants you've spoken of, these lowly people, by them I'll be held in honor. By putting God first and doing it right and having the blessing of God and the favor of God and not men, there will be those amongst men who will hold me in honor, who will see and say, I can follow that. Not that unjust king, Michael's mom. Now that goes on to say she never had another kid. She was, she was judged. So God anointed him from Samuel as he predicted, as he prophesied. We say prophesied. And... Um, and David stood in those, in those roles. Do you see it? Now I'm going to skip 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, verse 1 through 17. You can see he desires to build a house for the Lord, a temple. And the Lord says you, you, you can't do it. But he honors David's heart. And he has all these things in there where he talks about how he's going to establish David's throne forever. And that through his son he would do that. Because David... In all that he had to do, and, 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 and when he did what he did with Bathsheba, we remember part of the consequence of the sin was it opened the door for all those nations to be a problem to him, and he had to do war with them, and he had what the Old Testament calls blood on his hands, bloody hands. And, and God, remember Uzzah, God's about holiness. And David, you know, he was doing what he had to do, but it's like, no, you're not going to... You're not going to build it. Just like Moses was not allowed to go in the promised land because of what he did with the rock the second time. He struck it the second time instead of speaking to it. And so there's a consequence for the sin. There's forgiveness. God buried Moses. God received Moses. Moses appeared at the Mount of Transfiguration. God didn't reject Moses, but there was consequence for that sin. And David was not allowed to build the house. But he said, your son will. And the temple was built. And God's talking about that happening. 
but the throne. He's talking about this, and there will come one after you, you uh, your son. And, and, and let me jump up to uh, all of that, because it's so wonderful. You should read it. But let's go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 and 51. Did you know... Um, I just want to set the stage here. Let me go to Revelation 1.6. Because it talks about how this, there's a spiritual kingdom that's going to be established forever. And there's coming one who's going to sit on the throne of David. And we know that's Jesus. He's the son of David. And uh, we talk about that in prophecy updates and in our prophecy series. But in, in Revelation 1.6, just to kind of jump ahead, because y'all are with me. You, you know the word. He has made us kings and priests to His God and Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, what chapter in Revelation is that? That's chapter 1, right? So, this is, this is before the future. That, that's, that's during the time of the seven churches. Revelation 1 through 3 is dealing with that, that day and age. And the saints were kings and priests. And this isn't the only scripture, but I just wanted you to see that. And so that's not talking about the future kingdom yet, where Jesus is going to literally sit in Jerusalem, on, in the temple, on a throne of David. Because he is the son of David that was to come. And that's the eternal kingdom that you can go back and read in 2 Samuel. So on. Now, Matthew 27, verse 50 and 51, he's like, can that be true, that we're kings and we're priests? Matthew 27, 50 and 51, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He's up on the cross. He yielded up his spirit. In other words, he died. His spirit is, is gone. He's, it leaves him because he's dead. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. The veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the people and only the high priest could go into has now been torn because all of us are parts, members of a kingdom and priesthood that goes directly in. We have become the temple and he dwells in us instead of in the ark behind the veil. And we are kings and priests and we are to operate as kings and priests not just when we go to church on Sunday and Wednesday but everywhere we go. So if you're out barbecuing, or you're fishing, or you're driving down the road, and the Spirit of God comes all on you, and you just can't take it anymore, go ahead and pull over on the shoulder safely, and go get in front of your car, so you're away from the traffic, and just dance before the Lord. Praise the Lord. I've told the story about the woman <laughs> who got so full of the Holy Spirit after a some meetings like, you know, I was describing that we were in. Oh, you should have seen the move of the Spirit. The outward, exciting move. And she's driving home from a, a meeting like that. And the Spirit of God's all over. And she's just like, I can't drive. She's drunk in the Holy Ghost. She's I just can't drive right now. I'm so still so overwhelmed. So she pulls over. And she's just sitting in her car. Oh, oh God. Oh, glory to God. And a police officer pulls up behind her with his lights on. And he comes up to her and she's drunk in the Holy Ghost. And he's like, ma'am, you're going to have to get out of the car. He's going to do the sobriety check. Ma'am, you're going to have to get out of the car. And she's like, you know, and he's like, ma'am, you're going to have to get out of this car right now. And she's just like, <laughs> she's, she's just enjoying God. So he opens her door and crap takes hold of her and the second he takes hold of her boom the Holy Ghost comes all over him and so he falls out on the pavement the Spirit of God's all over him and so she's looking at him God uses her to get up and she helps him back to his patrol car and puts him in his car <laughs> and she's laughing and he's laughing back and and so he's in his car, oh, and just enjoying the Lord. And she gets in her car and then drives off. Now, how many of you ready for, 
for God to move. We are kings and we're priests. We should be loud. We should be expressing the presence of God, rejoicing in the Lord. And that is visible and it is audible and we need to not worry about where we are. And when we start doing that and have the attitude that David had that says, I will do that for the Lord because it was before the Lord and not the people. And I will do that. And not only will I do that before them and embarrass you, but I will be abased. I will be even beyond my own comfort. And believe me, as the shyest person in the world, in the natural, I get having to push myself. That's what I was talking about last week. Getting beyond the comfort zone and just doing what God says. And you know, if you'll do it, God will show up and He will show out with His glory and His power and His joy and it will impact other people. But we're going to have to give in. And that was the proper response. David had the right heart, the right approach, and God recognized that and established His throne and the priesthood through David who would be fulfilled in the great high priest Jesus, the son of David, forever. I don't know about you, but I want to be like David. I want to be a giant killer. I want to rule and I want to reign to the honor of God. I want to exercise the dominion and authority that God has given me to accomplish His will in this earth that He has, has, has me in, but not part of, but I'm in it, and to have an impact on. And I want to lead other people in the presence of God and into just letting go and letting God and worshiping the Lord. Kelsey, will you get up there? And I know this is you're going to have a chance to op operate in it. Will you lead us in that last song? They're going to play it, so you're not going to be like alone, but Lisa's not in here. I'm going to read to you. Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. And let me read to you at least the first part. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. That's David. And Jesus is saying, why did David, if David, the son of David, is supposed to do it, why did his son, why did he call him Lord? Because I existed before him. So I am the son of David in the natural humanity, but I'm his Lord. Why did he call him Lord? The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool and the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power in the beauties of your holiness from the womb of the morning uh, and, your, and the dew of your youth. And then it says the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of His wrath. That's to come in the millennium. David, uh, G Jesus is the son of David, has brought the kingdom, but He will bring that kingdom that's the heavenly kingdom, but the earthly kingdom of God will manifest itself in the millennial reign. And Psalm 110 will come about. So, Going back to the book of Revelation to close, Revelation 1 calls us kings and priests, and that was for them in that day. So it's the New Testament believers before the millennium. But now we go to Revelation 5, that's after the rapture, after everything is set up, and it says they sang a new song, <laughs> saying, "Worthy, you are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. This is the tribulation saints that go into the presence of the Lord and have made us kings and priests to God and we shall reign on earth. And, and so as you read Revelation, then Jesus comes with ten thousands and thousands of his saints and they rule and reign with him. So there'll be that in a natural kingdom literally having authority in the world, but we have a spiritual authority and have an impact on the world now. That Jesus will rule from a throne with a rod of iron. You will obey God's law. And we will rule and reign with Him. 
I don't know about you, but I have preached myself happy. I am enjoying the joy of the Lord. Let's go out. I know we're a little late. I don't care. I'm not going to say I'm sorry. I shortened some of this word for you to be nice, but I think we can't leave. Talking about David as a priest who worshiped the Lord without singing a song on our way out. Let's sing that last song and let's do it from our spirit, worshiping him in spirit and truth as Kelsey leads us. Just like David led them in the presence of the Lord, we're going to let her lead us in the presence of the Lord as we go out. And you're dismissed when the song is over. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Third song. Touching every 